Marker. The first time I read the script, I got through 10 pages and I was by myself in my apartment and I put it down because I was too scared to keep reading. I read it like Alice in Wonderland meets Dante's Inferno. I read it, I think, a week later in the afternoon in the sun and that's how, how I got through it, but that's what attracted me to the piece as well because it was definitely a page turner and it was something that freaked me out. When I first read the script, I was riveted. It's a spectacular piece. There's so much to it, so many levels, so many complexities, and so many wonderful themes that are permeating throughout. She's a child! She's just a child! It was quite scary. I just thought, wow, who's thought of this? How did we get these ideas? My first experience of Silent Hill was five years ago and I play on PlayStation 1, Silent Hill 1. And I remember I was uh, something like three or four hours into the game when I realized that I was playing a game which was completely unique, absolutely frightening, and basically one of the few games that actually could become a movie. I have produced the last the three movies of Christophe and on the set of our last uh, movie he told me, you know, I'm playing to a video game called Silent Hill, it's fantastic, it's scary. And like everybody he said, really? Is it, is it possible to be frightened by a game? And I said, yeah, and it's one of the most absolute fear I ever experienced in my whole life. <laughs> That's maybe the first game that we can say it was mature. It was conceptualized in a very mature way. So then it was an adventure because, you know, we had to go convince the Japanese people that produced the game, Konami, to give us the right to make the movie. And the only things that make the difference is the vision of Christophe. And action! They were anxious about the level of faith that a director will bring to an eventual adaptation because that game has such a cult following. The fan base for Silent Hill is very, very protective of the game. So we've been very careful to listen to the fans and to maintain the suspense and the areas that they really feel strongly about, like the means of illumination in the darkness and certain key characters and antagonists, so to speak. <laughs> He has a very surrealist sort of vision of the game and the game itself sort of explores the boundaries of reality and that's what, what the film does. The game of Silent Hill is an experience. Silent Hill exists by itself, it has no equivalent. It's, it's something frightening, it's something disturbing, it's something very beautiful. It's not only about fear, it's about emotion. There is not so many games that make you cry. I never adapted a game before, and I realized when I was doing that that it was completely different. When you're adapting a game, you're adapting something that actually you have lived for real. You have the feeling to have been there and bring back some truth about what was the experience to face that adventure. And the story is basically a background. And what was important in the idea to do a movie is bring back in the foreground that background story. So that was the most important challenge. Rose! When Christoph was setting out to make this film, he and Sammy called me up. And so I came in and, and next thing I knew it was, you know, what if we were to do this? And Christoph was, you know, what if we reinvented the wheel? And such began, you know, a multi-month process of hammering out a first draft. Whenever I approach anything to adapt, you have to be willing to completely disassemble it and to create something new. The one element that you must remain true to is the spirit of the material. If you're not true to the spirit of the material, then you've completely lost. Every gamer that plays this video game at home 
in the dark, I think we'll enjoy being in this theater in the dark again, having the same feeling and the same approach. But the other thing we strive to do is to make it logical on a level that those who have no idea what the game is about will understand and appreciate the suspense, horrific moments, and the plot line. Shad! I see her! She's there! Shad! We wanted to create something that derived elements from the, uh, the Silent Hill games and the Silent Hill universe, but was a bit of a creature on its own. Kristoff, on one hand, remained profoundly true to the source material, and I remained as true as any human could attempt to, to the spirit of the material. In fact, we would sit around with the, the game during the writing of the movie. We would, more than anything, study how the camera moved as it travels through the game. We kept a number of elements from the game and created sort of a composite. These games are very frightening because the character are very emotional, and basically they are very vulnerable. The characters in the game are one dimension, and it's not a problem because a game is like an experience where you have to face iconic characters. For example, there is a character named Dahlia. If we want to transpose her on, on the paper, we understand that she has not enough depth for an actor or for an actress. We decide to make her much more grey than black, and that's what we try to do with the different characters of Silent Hill. When you have to, to invite uh, the audience to follow you into a crazy, crazy, crazy world, it's good that you make it through a very simple motive, like the love of a woman for a kid. Hey, Sharon! Sharon! Christophe has reworked the idea in making it a woman searching for her daughter. The main theme of the film is motherhood. Who's a good mother? Who's a bad mother? The lead character of, of Silent Hill 1 is a man named Harry Mason. And he worked very well in the game. But when we start to write him, respecting his personality, we found that it's a woman. I don't think that it's important if the main character is, is wearing a dress or a pants. What is important is that we'll preserve the atmosphere of the game, which is the most important thing. So we decide that Harry Mason will become Rose. Sometimes the fan can be shocked by, to hear that because they know so well Silent Hill through the game. But I'm myself a gamer. I'm a true follower of uh, the Silent Hill mythology. And a game is a game, and a film is a film. I think what's really exciting about this movie is the cast. Um, there's a series of fresh faces, actors that you may be familiar with but you haven't seen them a thousand times before. They're going to bring life to the characters. Go! Go, go, go! When I did the casting, I very deliberately went toward actors from independent film because they bring with them something different, a different quality. Actress like Radha Mitchell, Deborah Karanger, Alice Creed, of course, Laurie Holden. You know, it's much more exciting to see somebody who doesn't used to do this kind of film. The audience of this type of movie love that. For the role of Rose, we needed somebody with that blend of vulnerability, but strength and determination as well. You have to feel her fear, but also appreciate when she stands up to the, all these terrifying moments. We spend lots of time finding the perfect rose in terms of the sensibility that Christophe was having on this character. I was looking for somebody who, for me, was sophisticated and somebody very vulnerable. And I think that Rada Mitchell has both quality. We have to leave. Do we understand the darkness is coming? It's 
very easy to fall in love with Radha Mitchell. There's a freshness, an energy, an excitement at life. There's this original look to her, all of which are precisely what we needed for the central character to lead us through this horrific environment. For the first uh, couple of days on set, I just ran and ran and ran. It was like, run, run, run. As the story goes on, the character gets tougher and stronger, and so hopefully you'll see that in the performance. We've also been playing the game, and that has a definite effect on your performance as well. That's the sort of preparation. It's kind of primal training. Christoph is focused on, on female characters. There's something unique about seeing sci-fi or this sci-fi genre with just females leading the story in a way. And, He's almost kind of exoticised the idea of femininity by polarising it with um, the male characters who are sort of grounded in reality and all the women are in this kind of fantasy nightmare. Rose, Sharon. It's a wonderful thing to work with Sean Bean. The man is so polished and professional in his work. Once he and Christoph had established who this character Christopher is, Sean Bean is that character. I'm in the real world, as it were, uh, and I'm looking for my wife, my daughter, who are in a, another dimension of time. My wife. We cast the part of Christopher, and it was the last one that we cast, and Sean Bean was a dream for us. He has a warmth of personality uh, that's always there, no matter what role he plays. He has this ambiguous quality, and it was interesting to, to invite this ambiguity into a very uh, positive character. The character of the husband looking for his wife. I think Christopher uh, goes through quite a lot of heartbreak whilst trying to find his wife and daughter. He's in quite a desperate state I mean, throughout the film. Put both hands on the wheel. We needed to have a Sybil who was strong, authoritative, but empathetic and could make all of us care when she eventually will sacrifice herself. Laurie Holden's perfect for all that. She has all of those qualities. This is by far my coolest action role. She's an action gal, but uh, she's got a heart. You know, she's a real person. What I like about Sybil is that there is a duality. She is very strong, but is very misunderstood. In the role of Dahlia, we were very, very lucky to have Deborah Kara Unger, a tremendous actress who was willing to play this role. We always want to work with her. When Christoph wrote this part of Dahlia, it was already somewhere in the mind that Deborah Unger will play the part. When Christoph proposed to me the idea of being able to work together, I said yes immediately, and then I read the script. Christophe and I have had a professional relationship for nearly 10 years. She's fearless. She will have no problem with looking as strange or as extreme as any director asks her to. For a true beauty like Deborah Kara Unger to agree to do that, uh, I find amazing. I've never played a part like Cassandra Dahlia before. Dahlia's been a much more complicated character than I anticipated her being. It's surprising to me that I like her so much. I love going to work every morning. I think a lot of who Dahlia is is what Deborah invested her with and, and just the way that she looks and so on. A lot of that came from, from Deborah's concept of the character. I visited every link on every fan site and I personally got very influenced by the gamers. Well, you couldn't find anybody more different from Alice Krieg than, than Christabella. Alice is incredibly playful and, and sweet and, and generous. She's got this enthusiasm and the imagination of a child. And not many people have that, and I was quite inspired. When I first read the script, and this is not to my credit, I thought, what is this? Is this what, what sort of science fiction slash horror? I didn't even know it was based on a game. I've never played a computer game. I don't have a child. My nieces and nephews live thousands of miles away. And then I had to read it again, and I started to see the resonances. We must burn this child! Alice, she's bigger than life. 
and I think that Alice brings a dimension to Christabella. Christabella is one of those characters who can so easily become a caricature and only someone with Alice's strength and focus and really precise technique could possibly create this character. I was very anxious about the language. Once again, we're locked in mortal battle. Christabella's speech is difficult to get right. Many times I said, the main character of this movie, one of the main characters of the movie is a little girl of 10 who's going to play four parts including something really yeah. evil. Look, look at the Where am I going to find a little girl who's able to do that? And not find only a little girl able to do that, but find also a little girl with parents happy to let their little girl do that. <laughs> when I first met Christoph, we were in the production office, and he said that at first he was worried that he wouldn't be able to find someone to play all three characters that were so strange. I will remember always the day Jodel came at the office, and she was walking into the, the office saying, where is the director, where is the director? He was watching a 15-hour miniseries. He watched it over the weekend that I had done. And I say, hi, Jodel, how are you? And she said, yeah. I'm fine, I'm fine. I say, you know, Jodel, you're going to play three different characters in this film. And uh, one of them is the devil. I always wanted to play the devil. He just said, perfect, so I'm here. <laughs> when Jodel plays Dark Alessa, it's almost like she's transformed and she's somebody else completely. And it's, it's really quite eerie and, and, and bizarre. I've only ever played like a normal little girl like Sharon a couple of times. But most of my roles are like, are like Dark Alyssa. I played an evil clone once. <laughs> and I don't know how this delightful little gem who likes pink can so easily grasp terrifying moments and then cut and crack a silly little girl joke. She's still every frame. I think she's somebody that's going to go very far into the cinema. Feels a resistance into your arm. To watch these transformations in these women has been very, very fun, and, and all of the characters are so distinct. It's certainly a female-driven piece, which is a delight. It creates a very playful environment uh, where we all have clearly different things to offer each other as characters and of course as individuals. Every day everybody's been challenged and everybody's been really pushing their limits and, and doing the best work that they can and taking everything very seriously and really putting their heart into it. Really there's a lot of love in it and as much as it's a kind of dark, dark story, there's a lot of love behind the making of this story. What Christoph uses in the rendition of horror films is, is the um, emotion of disgust. And he constantly disgusts us with his different, you know, visions and insinuations. Normally horror films are about confined space. It's about a house, a castle. It's very, very rarely more than that. For Silent Hill, we have to deal with a complete town. We basically have created the entire town of Silent Hill which is completely deserted, covered in ash, and occasionally consumed by the most malevolent spirits imaginable. It's been such a gift. We actually have this, this, this wonderful atmosphere and these, these sets that, that just really set the stage for us to play. Witch! You know, but I think it's great that it's slightly like that. Since a long time, I wanted to work with Carol Spear, who's a very important uh, uh, production designer. She's facing it, and it just bends slightly. Silent Hill is a town that has been abandoned by, for 30 years. The paint is peeling, the, the walls are crumbling. We had to show things in like three or even four variations. I mean, we had a set sometimes, other than having one look, had three or four looks. We have four different Silent Hill. So we have a Silent Hill, it exists now today. We have Silent Hill like it was 30 years ago. We have Silent Hill in the fog, and we have a Silent Hill when 
the darkness arrive and when all the nightmares and the creatures appear. Basically, there's a new set every 60 seconds. So it's a visual feast. There's constantly something new to look at. We were dealing with 106 different sets and locations in the film. It's huge. I mean, for a horror film, I think it's maybe the first time it happened. It was a real challenge to try to put all the sets together and, and just to, to create the texture. I have a passion for movies with texture, and texture just I mean, comes with the aging of, of sets. So I, I like sets that can have some age and also some history to them. Quiet, action. We found Silent Hill in Brantford. It was probably one of the best finds that we had found in terms of finding a location. She told us, I know a town not far away from Toronto. You will have the type of industrial look that you were looking for to build around that the universe of Silent Hill. Some of the businesses had closed out. They were going through some renovations, so a lot of sections of the whole street had closed down because they were going to renovate it. We were able to go in and redress and basically to make it look like the pet town had been abandoned for 30 years. Then you have the sets in the foggy world where there's a certain benign malevolence to them. Everything's gray, there's not much color. The color is, is more desaturated. Everything is falling apart and dilapidated. The mountain was just the bane of my existence. It was, you know, it looked like a road, a mountain road. We built it so we wouldn't have to do all those CGI shots putting in fog, and the only way to guarantee that we could control the fog was to build it indoors. So we spent eight weeks building the side of the mountain and then putting a road in and asphalting it. Then the darkness, everything is rusted, everything's decaying even further. It's just a world of rust and blood. And as we get further and further into the story, it goes from a very slight bit of rusting as she goes into the first set of darkness up to the hospital at the end where it's the walls are almost covered in blood it's quite horrific you know i mean it's like almost like a mental hospital that's covered in blood or and gore and it's just very spooky and very disturbing i like very much the set uh, where we have the darknesses playing around because it's a hospital but everything is decay everything doesn't exist except in a most of your nightmare vision. The hospital was two sections. We had a, a location that we used for the, uh, the upper floors of the hospital. It was actually a school that we changed into a, a hospital that was all aged and, and made to look like it had been abandoned for 30 years. And then the elevator section was built separately uh, and shot separately. And then there's the, this section was the basement. This is the main corridor of the hospital set in the basement. It was revamped and used for, to, to make up several different corridors within the space. They give us back our purity. Purity! The sets that I've worked on are, are remarkably beautiful in the sense that they really serve the universe of the film. We looked for a, an old factory that was a big, large space with a lot of texture that we could put this meeting hall in the middle, that they had this sort of secret meeting place. The design of the factory is based on uh, looking at a lot of photographs of old Amish meeting halls, and they're very simple designs and very, very straightforward, and I was trying to keep the lines very straight. After they finished shooting the, the meeting hall scenes, we came back in, ripped it apart, tore the hole through the floor, and uh, spent a long time burning wood out in the back of the studio <laughs> and brought it in and basically created an aftermath of the fire. It was one of the dirtiest sets we worked on. People would come out of there at the end of the day in, in their white coveralls, totally black. <laughs> My favorite set is the old school that we worked at. And it used to be a girl's school, a real girl's school, which is good because that's what it was supposed to be. <laughs> the school was interesting, it was fun to do because we cheated so much. We actually had a school location, but the actual layout of this real school and the layout of the school that we shot were two different things. And we were cheating rooms that were corridors uh, and rooms that were supposedly off of one another. Some parts of the school were in other buildings. It was a bit of a puzzle putting it all together while we were shooting. In the classroom, we had to deal with uh, th three stages. We tried to 
prep it as much as possible in, at the beginning and we sh tried to shoot it in order. We shot it with the past first, but they prepared a lot of the walls first. They, they used the release agent, which was a, just a simple lard underneath all of the paint so that we had a nice clean paint job for the past and then for the foggy world we could release a lot of that paint and have a lot of peeling paint. We had a lot of areas prepared behind the walls that we could take tiles away and expose bricks and studs. It's hard to say what my favorite set was. I mean, I enjoyed working on the church because it's just the scale of it. I walked into it and I had a visceral response to the space. The degree of detail and specificity evoke an emotion in you, being in them as an actor. The church was one of the first things that we started to draw up because we had an idea at the beginning. We did a lot of reference and looking at different churches that were in the Toronto area and outside of Toronto. We wanted it to be dark. We kept it fairly dark, lots of wood. It's sort of a real church in the, you know, the typical traditional layout of a church, but it doesn't have the, the altar area. It has, instead, it has the, the painting of the, the burning witch, not normal for a typical church and then it has the sunken pit for the, the meeting areas. We spent about eight weeks building the church. The painting was uh, done by a scenic artist here in Toronto. His name is John Fraser, and he probably spent three weeks working on the painting at night while we were building the set around him. He'd come in after, as we went home and he'd put the lights on and paint away. We'd come in in the morning and there'd be a, a little more built. We actually took pictures of some of the art department people in some of the costumes of the... <laughs> <laughs> and painted them into the painting. You probably wouldn't be able to pick them out, but there are a few art department people in there. <laughs> we used Deborah as the uh, guide for the painting. We didn't want it to be Dahlia, but we wanted it to look like it could have been an ancestor of Dahlia's or Christabella's. The lattice were, uh, were, were based on a design that we found. It was an old German etching of a, of a witch, uh, witch burning. We decided to hang the miners uh, from the ceiling in the church as after seeing uh, photographs of how miners in actual coal mines would store their gear on pulley systems that the, as they came up out of the mines they would have baskets with their masks and, uh, and their work clothes in it. So we thought it was an interesting idea and decided to store all of our miners' costumes in the church this way. Action! Then we tried to find the exterior of the church and we looked at a lot of different churches just for our look of the church because we didn't really want it to look too Christian. We wanted it to have a very distinctive look. Consequently, we ended up settling on not a real church but the actual uh, facade of a, of a Masonic temple. And the stairs leading up to the church, we had tried to find locations for it but we just couldn't find what we wanted. So we built in the studio a set of stairs that we then uh, composited the church at the top of the stairs and then we put the church, the face of the church, on the outside of our interior set. I think people are going to be surprised. People are going to be surprised by the scale of the film. And I hope that, that it will help to redefine a new kind of uh, horror film. It was Christoph's vision that Rose is very much a normal person in this unnormal world. But she does get to engage in stunts, <laughs> which is like every actor's fantasy. Steve Lesetsky was the stunt coordinator on Silent Hill. I always want Steve on any size picture, big or small. He can make things happen safely and quickly and magically so that people can be transformed. For a movie that's basically set out on the surface to be non-action, there are a lot of action elements incorporated throughout the entire filming of the project. Rod and Mitchell and Laurie Holden both have an extreme level of attention to detail for every single action and reaction that they do. I think that he made a great job training the actor how to move, how to shoot, how to jump, and be credible. Can you do that with a skirt? <laughs> they want every bit of their performance to be as realistic as possible. 
it's an extreme amount of work for both of them and the physical labor that goes into as well as the acting that they have to do at the same time has just gotten phenomenal as the days have gone on. I've gotten together with him and he's really helped choreograph these fight sequences. I go through the whole sequence, he watches where my feet are, what foot I pivot on where my weight transfer goes, when the ass baton gets snapped open, and what its arc is to make it look good for the camera. They ask these questions for every single action element that they do. Yeah, so that's good. Hands look, hands look, cut. Sybil just kind of takes me over sometimes. You know, I just get caught up in the physicality of it all. If you review the scene, you'll see that Sybil is not wearing any protective gear on her arms. And the miners are wearing these huge costumes with inch and a half thick metal underneath them. So every time I was hitting them, I was scraping up my arm, pretty much my right arm mostly, but both of them. And they were bruised and cut up and scabbed. But at the end of the day, it was so fun and exciting. And I look at all my war wounds as my, uh, my badges of honor. A typical shot on a lot of movies are done with stunt doubles. We shoot the actor's dialogue, then we cut to an over-the-shoulder shot where all we see is the back of their head and we never actually see their face. When Laurie and Rada are in the small utility room and Red Pyramid has basically cornered them in there, we did the opposite. We actually shot from the front face on so we could see both Laurie and Rada's faces throughout the entire sequence. I thought that I would just be primarily using my imagination. I never anticipated that there would be this huge blade that really was up against my neck. <coughs> Steve Luchescu, I mean, really choreographed me going up against the wall, and I was that far away from the blade. <laughs> I needed to get my head out of the way at the precise moment or there could have been a problem. For me, the scene in, in the boiler room was very much about playing limbo because this big sword would come in and over the top of us and I'd have to like bend back and try not to get my head cut off. So we rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it. The blade was coming in at a very slow speed at first and then we doubled the speed and doubled it again and doubled it again until we got to the final speed that we operated it at. That sort of athletic element of the film was fun, and I think it was something that both me and Laurie really enjoyed doing. There's different elements that we use throughout the whole movie with Rada. She's got a wardrobe that isn't very forgiving as far as the ability to put pads on her. So we have to put her in a special skid plate that we can drag along the floor that's molded to her body. Because if we were to drag her across the rough surface of the floor, it'd just shred the wardrobe. And every take would mean a wardrobe change and, oh, and on and on and on throughout the day. But by putting the safety elements into that, Lori can basically just grab her, drag her across a floor and through a doorway. I think most actors love wire work because it gives them the ability to do a lot of acts that they would never be able to do without the assistance of the wires. We get to see their face on camera. They get to jump higher and jump further than they can physically do all by themselves. So they get to play, they get to have fun, and they get to see their faces on the screen doing it, and so do the audiences. There is one scene, and I think it was one of my favorite days, where I come across a pit and, and I see Dark Alessa for the first time. And in order to get to her, I have to jump over all these um, metal beams. Rana's background didn't encompass any kind of wire work. So we started working with her, putting her in a harness, walking her on the ground, then taking her in small little jumps. And she caught on extremely quickly. And she just wanted to do more and more. She wanted to see the stunt double, how the stunt double would do it. And then she just simply wanted to do it. We shot almost all the footage of her going across the beams, with it really being Rod and Mitchell doing the jumps from beam to beam to beam all the way across. It's okay, I'm coming. I'm coming over. Well, I actually did have to jump and, and sort of keep my balance. So there's a certain amount of terror on my face you'll see in those scenes, and a lot of that was real. And of course, if I was going to fall, I'd be caught on the cable. But for me, it was quite exciting because I'd never done it before. Okay. 
Sybil sacrifices her life, this character wakes up to a fire at her feet and dies uh, by fire. No! How do you prepare for a scene like that? It was absolutely terrifying. It was boiling hot. I was on a 35-foot ladder with a metal harness that was um, digging into my skin. And they lowered me over a fire. There were real spikes coming out of the ground, metal and wood, with the fire. And all I thought was, as I was being lowered, one slip up and I'm impaled. So the terror and the fear and the heat was all very real. They try always to find a place for the real actor to do their part in order to be as close to reality. So we can make each one of the shots incorporating the actor's faces it makes it a great shot. They love it. This is great serious horror with a director that appreciates what you do monster-wise. I think a lot of horror movies work on the idea that less is more. And if you don't see the monster, it's scarier. Whereas Christoph's really brave. He shows you the monsters and features them and you see them and they're not gory, kind of ridiculous characters. There's an elegance to them as well. The creature is designed to be scary as hell and very disturbing also. They are slightly beautiful and completely revolting. My favorite monsters ever have been in this movie. They're bizarre and creepy, and they look like they've come out of some sadomasochist handbook. The monsters in Silent Hill sometimes are pathetic and strangely human. They're based on almost nightmares. Christoph's mantra right from the beginning was, I don't want disgusting, I want disturbing. It's disgusting and disturbing are very, very different. Disgusting and disturbing of the twisted human shape. It's not disgusting, but it's very, very disturbing. But something you can't take your eyes off. He doesn't want people to turn away, he wants people to be entranced. Patrick's company was hired to do the creature side of the movie, which is approximately half the effects. And I was hired to do the makeup effects. And I'm also supervising Patrick's makeup on set. So I'm the on set supervisor as well. Okay, good. The textures, whether they were slimy or dry or wet or crumbly or whatever. And the game was like the Bible. A designer doesn't bring his vision to a movie, he brings the director's vision to the film. Yeah. Amazing. I think it's amazing. The development of Silent Hill with Christoph started before the Silent Hill project was there. Meaning, I got to know the man, what he was interested in, which made the process of developing the creature on this project very, very simple. One of the key words that Christoph told me at the beginning, he said those beings are made Maybe a flesh, but plastic as well, real and artificial. All the creatures were designed based on that concept in mind. They are very real. There are humans in them, but somehow they come through like weird dolls moving on. And that's very, to me, very disturbing. There's always a sense of pain and suffering in a movie. Every one of those beings is suffering. Even Red Pyramid is suffering. Everybody's hurting. Ah! Screaming is another thing that Christoph wanted to see everywhere. He says he wants those things to scream all the time. I'd like now to introduce you to my favorite character on set. My personal favorite one is the armless character. Visually, I think that's my favorite monster. Well, armless is a suit that covers the guy completely. But it's also a very light suit. Getting into the costume, it's, it's not a long process. The armless character was just a two-piece costume that Patrick had designed. It was uh, a pair of skin-tight silicon legs that were airbrushed in mottled skin tones and like a plastic foam rib cage. Over the top of that was stretched a big silicon condom that was about four feet long, which strapped onto the actor Michael. Breathing is hard. If you're claustrophobic, like you can't do it. Oh, I'm breathing through that. 
yeah, on, opening this. and it comes with a mouthpiece with an air tube that goes through my bodysuit and out the back of my suit. So it's all like, like that. Patrick had designed it so Michael could wear the costume, there would be a, a manifold built into the chest and a little kind of a vent and a hose that would be plugged into a big pressurized container full of black methacel, which is essentially food thickening agent mixed with water and black pigment. And on cue, we were able to, to spray this out of Michael's chest. Three, two, one, spray! Good. He had a few little nicknames on set by the crew. My favorite one was Trojan Man. He looked like a big rubber condom walking around with a big hole in his chest that sprayed out acid. <laughs> The Great Child, that was something totally created from scratch. And the idea was having your skin sliding backward. I don't want the whole skull and jaws to be deformed. If this happens, you retain a face, a skeleton face here, just the skin has been pulled away, which is exactly the effect that Christophe wanted. Get off me! Great Child was essentially a foam latex and silicon bodysuit, which Patrick had created, which completely covered Yvonne's body. Little feet appliances, which blended the suit down into her ankles, and hands and a head, which would be glued down over her body every day. That process, about two and a half hours. You can't really hear me? You need to speak really loud. Really? Yes. Like yes. Once they dress me, it has to get sealed, it has to get painted, there's all the different parts that get put on, and when I watch the guys paint my feet, it's incredible, it's like getting body art. They painstakingly paint all this work, and it's so beautiful. The commitment to staying in that character was really impressive. Quite honestly, I didn't think I was going to survive. Can I stand you up? Patrick's team knew that I had this constant urgency to go to the bathroom. They specifically created a flap, so I have easy access to the bathroom all the time. Excuse me, the I have to go to the ladies' room. All right. There was a lot of excitement on set when the nurses came to set because they were en masse and because there were so many women that looked exactly the same with no faces, it looked kind of like a pack of animals. Those uh, designs came from the game and uh, this idea of like having no face and just a scream, we decided to just build a couple of generic masks which had the mouth open which later will be tweaked with CGI for expression and things like that. I created the costumes and the hats of the nurses. Essentially, we took a generic body form and sculpted distressed, rotting, putrefying skin in a very thin layer over that surface. We brought in 20 girls, so I created 20 latex nurse costumes, which uh, did up with zip ties and Velcro, because they had to be extremely tight on the girls' bodies. People in effects promise me that they're gonna make me one of those latex nurse outfits. I haven't received it yet, so I'm still waiting for that. Very nice, very nice. Roberto, the movement coordinator on the show, played the role of the janitor who is twisted into this tortuous shape, covered in crap and dirt, crawling across the floor with cockroaches coming out of his bum. So what we did was we took a cast of Roberto and we created two elements, which was a full-size artificial body of Roberto. And that was dressed into a set with barbed wire so the actress would come in and pull something out of his mouth. That was one element. The other element was Roberto in full prosthetic makeup with a <laughs> fake pair of legs strapped to his back bent up over and tied to his head with artificial barbed wire. The tattered costume he was wearing was dressed over the seam. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and give him a pair of uh, optical green pants, which we call these Kermit pants. I had uh, green tights so that, of course, they could cut my legs off in post-production. But essentially, you could shoot it from the side and from the front and from behind, and it would give the impression that Roberto had been bent double. The first day we shot this, and he's lying on the ground in all this dirty mud with this barbed wire wrapped around his head, and I just leaned in and whispered, 
Just remember you wanted to do this. But Roberto was able to pull it off quite magnificently. Roberto was able to take another part in the movie, which was the role of the Red Pyramid. The fact that he was a character that appeared in the, in the game pretty clearly, and on top of that, it's a fantastic looking character. There was not much need to try to do something different. We had to find the right proportion that would still allow an, an actor to carry this for hours on set. So we worked with very, very light material that are painted in such a way that they look extremely heavy, but bottom line, they were very light. My prosthetics, the upper body is glued to my skin. So the, the, the skin doesn't breathe, but it's so soft that it's like second skin. It was about one, two, three, four, five part prosthetic, which was blended into his skin and artwork by me and my team. And we also, apart from painting his chest, his arms and his neck, we also had to paint his bum cheeks and his legs because I didn't give him the option of having underwear. That process took about uh, two and a half to three hours every time Roberto played. Also, Wendy Partridge had created a leg extension, so he was just shy of seven feet tall in the complete costume. We really did come up with a very good 15-inch sole on this boot, and then um, with the costume coming back down, right down over the, the front of the feet, even though when you see him from behind, it looks like skin and you don't know what it is, but he actually has a boot on that's 15 inch tall. The boots have two metal things on the outside wrapped with a, with a band that, that closes with Velcro to hold my ankles really strong so it's nice and steady. And not only is he seven foot tall in the costume, he's also 25% uh, bigger than all the other humans in the movie. Action. To accomplish this effect, most of the time, it was just camera angles. But when he had direct interaction, i.e. grabbing somebody by the bloody neck, we created a miniature dummy for that effect. I don't think I've had a good day at work unless I have to take an hour to wash my hands. With Roberto, with Yvonne and with Michael, we, we couldn't have asked for a better bunch of people to play creatures. Because not only were they enthusiastic throughout the entire performance, but throughout the entire show, they never complained once. They made the movie for me by the fact that they'd come in each and every day going, hey Paul, how's it going? Great, let's put this on, let's go to work. I need some kind of attention here. It's not just about them. The whole movie has been a blast. Every day, you'd catch someone's eye and you'd just start laughing. This is why I got into the industry, to work on a big-budget horror movie with a bunch of great people and do some cool work. Christoph was absolutely dedicated from the beginning to have these creatures being choreographed. Roberto, the movement coordinator in the film, he coordinated the movement for the nurses, uh, the grey children, the armless character. He's the sort of brain behind how all these monsters moved. More arm, keep on, more arm and head. Roberto is a dancer, he's a choreographer. He understands how to create the movement, so it's very scary and creepy. More arm. These are cursed human beings in pain, and so it's an exaggerated body language. Who can do movement better than dancers? And who can train these dancers better than anybody else? Well, a choreographer. Okay, so please, the one, two, three, absolutely together and down. As a movement coordinator, I was with the casting director and looking for the three main creatures. With the armless, Christoph was convinced about Michael Coda. I went through an audition process. We had to audition with our, our hands behind our back and just move around, hit the floor. It was kind of choreographed, but it's more kind of what you had to put into it yourself creatively. 
by moving with his hands back, you could see that he really had no arms. And the way he was already in uh, walking and putting the knees towards each other, and Christophe decided to go for Mike because it was angular, yet at the same time smooth. It was already freaky looking without the costume on, without the prosthetics on. I can go all the way. Wow. Wow. Yeah. We just tried a lot of different things, you know what I mean? We had to try the moves jumping, we tried it twisting, we tried it on the floor slithering, we tried it running, we tried it falling. If I'm being shot, how am I gonna do that? What I think the problem was for Michael at the beginning was to not be overwhelmed by the costume. His arms are like this, he's wrapped around. They put this hat on him and that's it. He's completely blind. Of course, if you don't see anything, it's already difficult to walk. You can just imagine big movements in a very crooked way. You really gotta count your steps and really know your surroundings or you can get really, really, really hurt. As soon as you feel the left to the shoulders, just turn slightly and go forward, all right? Say I'm walking forward, I turn around and somebody shoots me. I have to be pretty much put on my mark and I gotta really count out so it'd be like three steps this way, turn around, get shot, and it's three little chugs backwards. Go, 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 all right? Roberto tells me what to do, how low to go, and just puts pictures in my head that really help me get the acting across. Parker, action. Stay on the left, stay on the left, left, left. Now turn to the right, straight ahead as you want. Straight ahead, like this, straight ahead. And Michael, stop, ready, and press. As far as great child, I called Yvonne because I thought she would be perfect. And when we put the video in for Christophe to see, he picked Yvonne instantly. Christoph and I had a little conversation. He really wanted us to embody what Great Child would really be, physically. From the shoulders, reverse the theory. In the rehearsals, which really was the creative process, we played around with the idea of what a strange looking creature child would be like, going on the basis of a kid. Oh, like yeah. a two-year-old who can't balance. Yeah. And distorted it a little bit more found much more bizarre ways of how this creature would carry its arms, its head, how their feet might be. It's like a tightrope walker. Tightrope walkers, you know, they use their hands to balance. She could see a little bit from the ear. It was the little hole that she could see. But it's not always in line with my hole because the head shifts. Once in a while, I'll get a glimpse of the, of the outside world, and so through that, I can make certain visual marks through that. sort of helps a little bit, but a lot of it's through feeling. And through Roberto yelling at me, because I can't hear in that mass, neither can they hear me. So it is a different world. So try not to do a big, big circle. Action! <laughs> To be honest, I never saw her face in real life. I don't know what she looks like. So she was this kind of mystery woman and I could sort of hear what she was saying. I'd listen to her and she'd listen to me because she couldn't hear very much behind the mask. So it was an interesting relationship. Hello. <laughs> Having Roberto on set has been great because being another dancer, a choreographer as well, he is able to speak my language. For instance, if somebody says to me, can you crawl? There are many different ways of crawling. And that's where Roberto has been amazing. He's able to interpret that, work with me on that, and we've been able to figure out very quickly, because you don't have a lot of time on set, what the director's looking for. tried to do with the nurses was to be as close as I could be with, uh, with the movement in the video game. I got into the studio, I knew exactly what I wanted, and Christoph was in the studio as well, and he knew exactly what he wanted to see. Do a 
by three key nurses, Chantal, um, Donna, and Rosalind. And Donna is the one whose lash is red. And Donna already in rehearsals came out with this really kind of aggressive movement that Christophe really liked, and he decided that Donna was going to be the one who was going to slash. We were shooting really, really fast, so some of the stuff we didn't get to rehearse. And on this particular day, we had a, I had a fight scene with a nurse who had no face, so she couldn't see very well. And she ended up punching me <laughs> in the jaw. They were my favorite ones, just because it was such a strong and, and bizarre, crazy image. I played two creatures in the film, the Red Pyramid and the Janitor. Christophe meant for the janitor was to be obscene, and my head is tilted back, so I can't even really move my head that much. The only thing <laughs> that I could really use to make it obscene was my tongue. Yeah. Okay. But no, not that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah? Really? Yeah, I think. My next favorite monster is Red Pyramid. He was actually a really kind of intimidating image and the way that he moved was really very simple but very balletic. What I was trying to do as much as I could was to reproduce exactly the movement from the video game. As soon as it hits. Gravity hits, he goes exactly, with the exactly. That's and then he flips it back. Exactly, that's the idea. Yeah. I did my best effort, but the first day when all the elements were in place, meaning the tall boots and the helmet that is at least 12 pounds heavy. So my first hour was on set was quite difficult, I would say quite challenging. Hey guys, make some room, please. And plus you're carrying this big heavy sword, which is not in reality, so it's all, it's all faked by the movement. I have to make the sword look like it's incredibly, incredibly heavy, and so it adds to the movement. And I can only see the floor, so I can't see uh, in front of me. It does affect the balance. There is a period of adjustment that it's needed. And all the women on set really liked that character because he had a naked bottom and you'd see that <laughs> on set every day. So he, he's really, really scary from the front, but not so scary from the back. It's a lot of fun. You, you feel like a little boy. I mean, this has been a boy's dream. It was a lot of fun. Something that I would not suggest people to do it in their homes, but, but absolutely was an incredible treat.